Welcome to episode 34. Check out what we have in store for you this week. Mine has one mode. <laughs> Screw me over. That's what mine has. That sounds exactly like any project I would take on. Because a lot of people go to Zoom or go to that type of experience. And I think the question I wonder is how do why? I wonder why, you know? Um, <laughs> nobody goes to Skype anymore because apparently they failed streaming. It, it started pretty heavily with uh, a guy that you and I know by... Well, we, okay, we don't actually know him. First of all, let's be very clear you know about Ninja? that. <laughs> I do not Is that who Ninja. you're referencing? <laughs> Welcome back, folks, to another episode of the High Tech Podcast. This is William Illingworth, joined by Joshua Swartz. Me. That's me. We're here. I'm here. We've uh, we had a week off. It was nice. I was a bit. I was about about traveling on recording. At least a week off recording. Yeah. But uh, we're back. I was at home. You went uh, living my living my normal life. You, not on vacation. You went between the first floor and the second floor. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, it was a thing. It's quite rainy here in Pennsylvania. Yeah, bummer. Um. So I was. Yeah, in, I don't know. It was probably. It was beautiful in Texas, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. It was. There was like one. It was. There was one like really hot day, and then it became fall, and it was perfect. Oh, that's good. I'm I'm happy for you. Yeah. Well, you know, it'll, it'll get there here too <laughs> eventually. Yeah, you know, next year. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we are stoked, folks. Uh, Josh and I have been talking through a lot of different planning and stuff. We're coming to the end of 2021. Last couple episodes in this 2021 crazy. here ahead of us. We're pretty excited for that. Uh, we're calling 2021 season one. There's a spoiler yeah. alert. We have, we're have we doing seasons now. Did you guys realize that? Yeah. You've been listening to season one this entire time. We didn't know that either, honestly. We didn't either until a few weeks ago. And then we decided... Um, when we were like, hey, let's do a season approach. But, you know? of course, that means that uh, 2022 is ahead of us. We are going to be taking some time off around Christmas. Not as many episodes and, and recording going on at that time. But uh, as we come into 2022, we're going to be launching season two. So hopefully you'll be enjoying some new ideas, some fresh approaches to the podcast. Hopefully it's not yeah. too crazy. but Yeah, you know, high tech is going to be upgraded. You know, it's going to be we're gonna use some more tech. Cool. We're going to use some more tech do some cool stuff have some more people do some more segments maybe even have little series of things coming up it's gonna be it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty cool um so now we know you're gonna be depressed over christmas because we won't be there what are you gonna do with your lives you know but that's so sad not listen to us you know i know it's yeah the people are gonna be knee deep in eggnog just trying to you know i you know yeah exactly some people make some seriously intense eggnog and others (laughs) too I, uh, my family um, has a, a long standing recipe for eggnog. So, yes, if you come to our house for Christmas, whew. do not expect to be drinking the light stuff. Do not drink a lot of it. Or do, <laughs> depending on what type of holiday you want to have. I don't know. Trying to do the National um, Lampoon's Christmas vacation, drink exactly, the eggnog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Now, um, um, as we think about, you know, next year, some new stuff, we're going to be going in there. Of course, we're going to need some skills to get there. And Josh and I oh, nice transition. are wondering this week of one another, what's one skill that we wish we had that we don't have currently? We might, we might need it for next year. What do you got? It's true. You meant, I might need it for 2022. So mine, mine is simple. I wish I was better at like home projects okay like skill Ooh. i wish i was i was better at like you know i can't even i can't even describe it that's how bad i am at it right like i wish i wish i had more skills with like you know handyman type projects that is not my thing i can come up with a system for you i could be organized i can you know you could plan the project stuff i could plan the project i could be a great project manager for that project but uh, when it comes to actually doing the home repair work, it's it's not great. Like a perfect example would be this week, Will, just going to hang a shelf for my wife in the kitchen. Uh oh, you know, and we have brick wall. <laughs> Famous last and words. You know, <laughs> and I thought I was going to be able to overcome this problem. I bought a hammer drill. If you don't know what a hammer drill is, I didn't until a few months ago. Uh, it's apparently the dream product. You need to be able to drill into brick. Um, and I tell people this and everybody's like, this is a perfect example. I tell people this and everybody's like, well, you didn't know that? No, I didn't know that. <laughs> what class did I have that went get a hammer drill? Like nobody. And I tell my, you know, my dad and he like, is like, you didn't know this? No, you didn't teach me this. You know, this is your fault. 
<laughs> Nobody told me about a hammer drill. Anyway, okay. So I go to hang this shelf, and I realize I don't have screws for, you know, for masonry stuff oh, anymore. Yep, so yep. I have to go to Home Depot, and I buy the masonry scrolls, screws. But a professional would have known to go, maybe I should make sure that these screws can fit in the hole of the metal things that the, the uh, shelf hangs on. I didn't. They did not fit in the hole. So I proceeded to grab a drill bit, use my hammer drill, and try to expand the holes on the metal thing. Now, I would like to point this out. It worked, darn you, okay? I expanded them, but not after I almost lost control of one of the metal pieces oh, on God. the drill bit. <laughs> and it flew off the drill bit, hit me in the leg, and bounced off of our washer. And I now have this huge gash on my leg. And this is a very long story. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I've been traumatized. And I needed to share it with all of you on the podcast. But I wish I was better at home repair so that crap didn't happen. <laughs> So I um I I feel like I do have some of those skills. I I agree with you. You like, have more than I do. It is sure. a There's lot better no to work with, that. you know, your father or father-in-law on one of these kinds of projects. You know what I mean? Like you just trust yeah. them to have the skills that yes. you know you don't have. But I yeah. I I already had a hammer drill. I do know what a hammer drill is. I actually have one oh, that's, that's got three nice. different modes. So Oh, aren't you fancy? You know. But um mine has one mode. <laughs> Screw me over. <laughs> <laughs> that is nonetheless i mean even with my like slightly more than you approach to handyman skills or whatever like i'm still not that great that sounds exactly like any project i would take on like you go to drill a hole in the wall once and then you end up doing things for three hours you know what i mean like that happened yeah. to me trying to swag a you know a chandelier and uh, i drilled in the ceiling you're supposed to be able to just pop the thing in the ceiling and put the swag nope there was something behind the hole that I put in there, and then the hole wasn't this, and then I had to do that, and then I had to cut a bolt. You know what I mean? It's like, it should be a 15-minute project, any video on YouTube, but <laughs> we digress. My skill, I mean, this just drives me nuts because it's, like, it's so simple as well. I just, I just want to be bilingual. Like, I love language. I study mm. a lot of languages, but I really wish I was fluent in another language. I think it's, I think it's really important. Uh, to be able to communicate with other people, to be able to like understand more cultures, so that's why I do a lot of work with languages. Yeah. But uh, Spanish or Chinese or something French, I would love to just be able to speak another language. There's not nearly as many um, opportunities to hurt myself or throw things at my shins while speaking another language as with your uh, handyman skill approach, but that is what it is. So our skills aside, how? Do we create a virtual classroom? That's our conversation started this week. We are looking to dig into the virtual classroom experience. Josh and I, of course, live and work in the virtual world, but we want to yeah. uh, kind of tease it out a little bit about what we even mean by a virtual classroom as opposed to online education, right? I would say online yeah. education is like the broader subject or the broad study of of doing class online. But a virtual classroom to me would mean like, trying to recreate the physical classroom in a virtual space yeah. um do you have any I, different I, thoughts yeah i think i think maybe my the way i think about it is maybe a little bit different like to me online education is just the the space of online digital education and within there is kind of the subcategory of this virtual experience that we can create um that often gets this kind of like and we define this versus synchronous and asynchronous as well. But right, I think right. where I fit virtual into is this, like it's, it's a space where you are literally together virtually. Like, and I know that's like, that's my own definition. It's not an official definition. Cause I, I could see valid arguments being made for like, well, my, you know, learning, you know, course site, course, course space in the LMS is a virtual, you know, classroom. Uh, but I think that's where I like the virtual and online kind of break for me. Like virtual is a, is an experience I like that. a live experience of some sort, I think is how I started to define virtual online is more of the, the course encompassing all of those different right. elements. Right. Um, because that's where I would define like a course as like a learning environment as opposed to like a virtual oh, good classroom. Right. Right. Cause um, I think both of them, cause there's going to be a learning environment and that doesn't have to be synchronous or asynchronous, but there's going to be, there can be a virtual environment and 
I would lean towards the point that yes, if you're trying to create a virtual environment, it's going to be synchronous. It's going to be Zoom. It's going to be yeah some sort of online platform where you're like second life like whatever it is virtual to mean means something happening in live time yeah and i'm sure somebody listening to this can find reasons why our definitions don't fit and to that i say you're right so go us but for now this is how we're going to define virtual classroom because it fits with what we're trying to do in these conversations um and so i think we want to talk about like how to how to create a good experience like that yeah um, now, the place I think we immediately go to when we talk about something like this, when we're talking about this uh, session together in the same place, is a lot of people go to Zoom or go to that type of experience. And I think the question is, I wonder is, why. I, <laughs> wonder why, you know? Um, <laughs> nobody goes to Skype anymore because apparently they failed um, and nobody remembers who they are. Uh, hashtag not a sponsor, obviously. <laughs> um, so the but how do we how do we handle this how do we do this how do we bring this all together into this experience and create a good experience um now it's gonna be two parts because we don't have enough time to talk about all this in one area Sweet and i Christmas think we have now. another kind of realm of this to talk about but yeah um yeah yeah to that point like when you consider a virtual classroom experience i do want to say that some folks might meet like i actually had faculty come to me when we were in the pandemic the deep in the pandemic and they said hey I'm tired of Zoom. I want to do something different. How do I get my students into the same virtual space as me? Like, can I use, I don't, I don't know. I've heard of those Oculus things. Can I use that? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, all right, A, I, I, I appreciate where you're trying to go. B, maybe you just need to work on your Zoom uh, management and Zoom delivery to make it more engaging in the first place. But I'll put that aside. I hear you. You want something virtual. The Oculus and those like handheld devices aren't necessarily the best play way to get into this. You know, they're actually a very limited scope. Um, they are gaming systems. You know, the the worlds that are in them. Um, I've I've seen like I forget what it's called, but like Facebook has like a a virtual world experience that you can play on the Oculus that you can walk around and you can see other people's avatars and stuff. But it's not like it's not an academic in any sense. Like there's no way necessarily to cultivate like, Hey, and here, let me share my screen while I'm on Oculus and I'm going to teach you about quadrilaterals. Like it, you can't, you could talk about anything you want to in that space, but there's no way necessarily to like deliver learning content through their platform yeah. and their platforms be built to be a gaming system, right? So you're not necessarily going to like take that and twist it to make it work for your space. If, if you can, I mean, there could be some way I'm not saying don't ever try, but my first response to folks who are looking to do virtual classroom experiences is to come back and say, you're trying to be synchronous with your students. You're trying to be online at the same time with them. Or maybe like you're, you know, maybe you're doing something like streaming where they could be online with you, but they could watch the recording later. So let's focus in on that. Let's cultivate what you're trying to deliver. You know, usually you stand in a classroom with a PowerPoint projector and a whiteboard. What of that do you want to bring with you into the virtual experience? Do you have all your slides made? Because you need to have slides if you're going to go virtual. Do you have, you know, usually you give a handout. Do you have something like that that's digital already? It's a Word document at least. So you can, like, there's a lot of considerations that go into making the virtual classroom experience before picking if it's going to be on Zoom or rest in peace Skype or Twitch or any of these platforms, right? You, you need to have all that kind of digitization stuff done before you go into the virtual teaching. Yeah, you have to bring the just like you would in a regular classroom, you have to bring, bring a lot of the content with you. It just, it looks different um, in the way you do it. Um, and uh, it just, it depends on what you want to bring over, what task you want to do. I feel like we talk about this like it's some magical different thing, but at the end of the day, it's like to create a good, virtual classroom experience you just need to identify what the type of things or activities you want to do and then look for the virtual like look for the digital solution to that because at the right. end of the day in the virtual experience you're not going to have the same touch points that you do um in a regular face-to-face -face class right. uh, that you're doing so in a lot of forms this takes uh, is on zoom or one of those other tools that we're talking about we'll talk about a different one today that you could think about it a little bit differently if you really wanted to um, but that's how you're going to bring that in. How do you handle the, the homework and stuff you're going to give to them? How are you going to engage the students? It's the same problems you deal with in your physical classroom. <laughs> it's just, you're not used to doing it in a video platform or virtual space. Yeah. Um, and so you have to, to have to handle that a little bit different. So I think the way we come to this conversation is to say, okay, I think the best starting point is not necessarily what do you want to take from your physical classroom and bring over? 
but what are the hurdles that you're going to experience in a virtual environment that are different than you're going to experience in a physical environment? Hmm. Um, like, cause that's really where I think it comes down to is the fact that like to create a good learning experience in a virtual classroom type of setup in a, you know, live online session, you need to acknowledge the hurdles that you're going to come across in that area. Some of them are the same. Some of them are not the same. Um, so like a good example of this would be in a physical classroom. Um, one, if you really want to, you can outlaw computers, although I disagree with that policy, <laughs> uh, but it's fine. Um, in a virtual, you can't. Um, so they're always going to be there. And it's way easier for your student to just open up something else and look at it in a virtual experience. Right. Um, and uh, so keeping attention is an extra difficult task <laughs> in, in the virtual experience. Um, the other piece is you're disconnected from each other. So mm. you're going to to struggle with that you don't have the physical presence component to engage with students so creating that engagement is going to be extra hard um trying to connect with them is going to be extra hard the the ironic thing about what we're going to talk about with the tool we're going to be using is the problems you're going to experience as an instructor they're going to be slightly different um, but they're very similar to what streamers and things struggle with online yeah um is like how do i how do I keep people engaged? How do I make them feel like they're a part of what's going on? Like they're not just watching something right. that's happening. Um, how do how do I do those things? Um, and that's, I think the biggest issue is just how do we, and that's where I think at the core, a lot of these people who ask you about like, how do I get people into the same space? And their solution is VR. Cause they're like, I have to do, it's, if it's they can just be, like, be with each other. <laughs> it's like, I've seen Tron. Is this how it works? Like, do we put a headset on and they just end up together? Um, and it's like, well, no, I mean, you just create that experience differently online. And so I think if those are the problems you're trying to get across, distraction, surprise, you deal with that in a physical classroom too, so it's not any different. But the lack of connection, the it's, I think, a lot easier in a virtual experience mm. for people to kind of just check out on what's going on um, and to feel like they're present and a part of that. Then the solution is how do I find and do activities or things in the midst of my virtual classroom experience that will help overcome those issues and help better learning happen um yeah. and so i think that's kind of what we're trying to deal with um now i feel like we need to provide some solutions because i feel like we're just mainly thrown out you know well scenarios and questions you know I, I i have the solution in mind um but i want to try and get to like even even what that solution should look like right like we can give them technical ideas about how to deliver it but i want to get to maybe uh, you you mentioned streaming like i think it's a, a pretty tangible way to kind of demonstrate what it could be like right so you know teachers like what your classroom is like when students aren't engaged you know what you've liked on your best day ever that kind of stuff right like you kind of got to have a sense for that when it comes to the virtual space like i've been in streaming sessions where the streamer maybe had 12 people watching they might have been talking to the camera. Uh, they might have had music going on. They might have asked for people to give thumbs up and different things like that while they're doing stuff. But like there's 12 people in the room, like like nothing's happening. So the, the, the streamer is literally just sitting there like playing the guitar or whatever for themselves, by themselves. But there's um, there's kind of a next step up from that where I've seen streamers who have got maybe like 50 to 60 people play, paying attention and like their dynamic changes a little bit. Like while they're sitting there, like, yeah, they might still be asking for certain things or, or looking for some level of engagement from their, their, um, their community, but they'll start to like, just do whatever they're doing. And they, and the chat or whatever will start to ask for the streamer to do stuff or engage with the streamer on certain things. Right. Where almost if it's that like first level or that low level engagement, like the, the streamer is trying to produce as much as possible to get a response. They take a step up from there and it's like, well, now that the chat's actually trying to produce something themselves to get the, the instructor to respond or to get the, the, the streamer to do something. Uh, but then, of course, you've got those folks who literally have thousands and thousands of followers, right? And you go into a stream session with them and the, the, the chat on the side of the screen just scrolls the entire time like there's no way there's literally just hundreds of people saying stuff at the same time in these chats and there's no way to, for the streamer to keep uh, track of it or make sense of it so i think in that that spectrum is where our solution is right i think that you don't necessarily need to have uh all your students actively responding to you doing you know chatting q a whatever that is like at the same time or cluttering up the space or confusing each other or interrupting you right 
but you don't necessarily, you don't want it to be like you're sitting there alone. I think that middle ground is really what we want to try and cultivate where your students are, where your students might be comfortable in zoom or on a stream or whatever to ask a question or to interrupt you or to provide some other thoughts, right? But not to become disruptive where you can't get through an entire lesson's worth of content, right? I think there's a balance in what we want the end product to be like, whether it's Zoom or another tool. Then, then it's up to the tool, right? I mean, like, I think that if we're talking just Zoom, creating a virtual classroom is as simple as, like, making sure you still refer to students by their names is helpful, calling on students to do things, asking for students to volunteer for things, using breakout rooms. Like these are really important steps to a virtual classroom experience that I think start to get those students into the digital presence. We know what their physical presence should be when they're in the physical classroom, but we have to like do things to show them what their digital presence even should be when it comes to virtual space. Is there something else that you would say like that would get somebody started with, with their virtual classroom? No, I mean, I think that covers it. Like, I think that's, again, what, what your point is. Like, it's, I think there's two couple reactions people have to all these conversations. Um, and one of them is called, like, you know, I called me the over-eager person. The person who's like, I need yeah. to solve all these problems. And now they're trying 15 different things. They got chats running. They got this running. And the reality is most of us are not that level of how we do stuff. So it's one of those things where I think we need to pace ourselves and br- kind of, you know, be careful about all the stuff we bring in at the same time. I think at the end of the day, it's finding those places to be like, how do I make sure students feel, have an open avenue to ask questions during the class or during the session? How do I make sure it's not just me speaking for four hours yep. or an hour yep. or however long you're going um, and create that? And and how do I create some of that collaboration and engagement with the students? And there's a lot of, if only you had a podcast that had suggested plenty of tools over this, you know, last year. <laughs> of how to do that stuff, you know, because at the end of the day, I'm like, I want to find a decent whiteboard tool for myself to use. And what I'm going to do in that space, um, I want to find some tools that are going to help encourage engagement. And, uh, you know, we've talked about stuff like Nearpod and uh, Top Hat and tools that allow you to create engaging polls and stuff within presentations yep. that can all be well used in live virtual experiences um, that create a good environment for students to engage with. Yeah. Um, I think, if, you know, setting some of those policies for you, allowing the flexibility sometimes for students to turn webcams off and stuff if the tool you're using allows them to turn on webcams. Um, but at the end of the day, it's keeping communication lines open um, and um, diversifying what you're doing. You know, not doing the same thing the entire time. Yeah. But the, again, all those practices are the same thing you would try to do in a regular classroom anyway. It's just that the way you're doing it, I think it just becomes... In, especially important in the virtual experience to do that um, and to create that well, that kind of that virtual classroom experience yeah. um, for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not something that's easy. And I think you're right, Josh, to say like diversify your approach. That doesn't mean folks like use zoom this week and, and Skype next week and where by the week after, oh, like, no, that's not please don't, what I please mean, don't yeah. take us wrong there. Right. It's like, you're going to use zoom all semester or whatever it is, but um do different kinds of things in the class itself, have projects, have group work, have, have just lecture time, you know, like mix yeah. up that delivery because you are trying to create a virtual space that reflects the physical space. Um, and, and it's, it's not easy, but the one thing I know is like during the pandemic, of course, like I've done, I've, I've done the trivia, right. in face-to-face context. And, and we've, Josh and I have gone trivia together with some of our friends before time and time again, but during the pandemic, it's the first time I ever did virtual trivia. Uh, and you know what? It was, it was fun and it had some prizes and stuff still, but it still lost some of those presence elements, right? Like there wasn't the chance to t- turn to your buddy if you were on virtual, if you couldn't be together, which many of us couldn't be through most of the early pandemic time frame, you know, like, you had to just do it alone or you had to get your friends on, you know, the phone for gosh, you had to call your friends to do trivia. Like it was a very tri- tricky time. But uh, now we've got to kind of take those considerations and the things we've learned from that and bring that forwards into um, into virtual classroom instruction. Now, um, it, this is a this is a uh, of uh, an audio podcast. Of course, you hear us. so You can't necessarily see that like this entire time I've been working on a slow slow twitch in my shoulder i mean i don't know something's just been feeling a little off <laughs> hurting a little bit 
I don't know. I've been, I've been noticing it. Yeah, things don't look, you know, Stools. you're looking off, man. It must be all that nice weather in Texas. Oh, yeah, like, really, really, really messed me yeah. up. You, know, that you didn't Twitch suffer enough. Going. Um, I don't know. I had no better attempt at trying to transition our topic than to make that joke. Did it's, you know, it happens. It just, it's, it's fine. We are, we are going to be talking about a tool today called Twitch. Um, now, for some of you, this tool may be like, seriously, you guys are tell, telling us about Twitch. I know what Twitch is. Um, you're, you're right, but some don't. Uh, and I think, especially in the education world, it's not like known that you would know what Twitch is. Will and I know Twitch really well because we're nerds and we like to play video games. And this is where Twitch originates, um, <laughs> is from video games. This streaming uh, phenomenon, I think I would call it over the last, you know, decade, probably, yeah. is how so long, you know. Streaming's been taking different forms over the last, you know, it's decades probably too long, but um, streaming's kind of become a big thing, especially in the video game world um, of watching people play video games and doing that type of stuff, entertaining online, um, this live kind of video experience. Was I wrong in a decade? No, nope, exactly correct. It launched in I was exactly correct. 2011 is when Twitch launched. Woo! Nailed it. Look at me. He wasn't okay. even trying, folks. I wasn't even trying and I'm accurate. Um, so yeah, so it's been around for a little while. I would say it's become much more popular and in like pop culture and known within the last couple of years, especially yeah. people have made um, some big like, money on it too with the with yes, pandemic. And stuff it like kind of started. I think it's safe to say when it comes to like people who made money off of streaming, it, it started pretty heavily with a, a guy that you and I know by, well, we, okay, we don't actually know him. First of all, let's be very clear you know about Ninja? that. <laughs> I do not Is know that who Ninja. you're referencing. <laughs> um, I meant like we know of him. Right, okay, right, yeah. Right, like right. that's. I realized as I was saying, I was like, it makes it sound like I'm friends with Ninja. I have no clue who that guy is, other than seeing him stream. Um, that's about it. Um, so I would say like he was really one of the big prominent ones. Yeah, anyway, in video games. Um, in video games especially um but streaming twitch is a streaming platform that's why we're talking about it yep. um it's very popular in gaming but there's a lot of other stuff that gets streamed through twitch um now will if somebody came to you i've said this before elevator pitch somebody walked between the elevator and just for some reason as a weirdo turned around to you and went i heard about this thing called twitch <laughs> do you know what it is <laughs> that's amazing what would be i love that what would be your what would be like your two minute elevator description of twitch twitch is a video based live streaming video based <laughs> live streaming wow, platform that was, wow. wow that was so i just was, my brain just broke in the gonna, middle of that one i am i am gonna be honest that was that was pretty bad <laughs> oh god that was that was bad. You just failed that elevator pitch hard. Wow. That was... <laughs> so in a classic Willy Wonka form, strike that, reverse it. Twitch is a video based streaming platform that allows you as a content creator to directly engage with your content consumers. I think that's its selling point, right? YouTube has been yeah. around for for 20 years, maybe now. Right. But YouTube started with put up a video and then eventually put up a video and people can like it. All right, people can like it and they could comment. People can like it, they can comment, and they can subscribe. Like YouTube added all this stuff all over time and like got people more engaged in the videos, right? But originally YouTube was just like, put your video up there for free. Twitch from day one said, I want you to not only put your video up here live while you're doing something, but we it always had a chat. It always had people and a community element who could be there and subscribe to your video, watch while you're doing something live, whatever. Like Josh and I know it, of course, from video games, but I've actually seen people like literally do uh, instrumentals, like, like doing music, guitar, just playing an instrument. I've seen people doing like knitting, not necessarily instructional either. Not like, hey, so here's how to do a whatever, you know, type of knit i'm doing um it, like more like i'm gonna sit here and knit a hat does anybody want to talk while i'm doing it and some people then will ask questions like what's your type of yarn what's your needles whatever you know those i don't i've known nothing about knitting right i'm offending like 20 uh, people it right is now. not coming to be obvious at this um, moment, that's for sure but i've even seen like and josh has even participated in folks who like will play a a, a, a tabletop board game oh yeah i was right? a part of one i forgot about that right. I, like you just I play a board say game I've, and stream 
I can say I've been on a stream. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, there you go. Look at, look at me, you know? Um, I know somebody I who, who did a presentation on streaming um, at a conference I was at, and what they did was they actually had someone do a live stream while they were doing the presentation, and they brought it up and, and watched it, and then were able to qu ask questions of the person. So it was all planned, right? But the person was just doing a, an illustration in Adobe Illustrator. And so they were streaming themselves doing the work, and then they got to talk about it. That's where we think the educational value is for tw uh, for Twitch. If you, I mean, just want to do class, of course, that makes sense. But if you wanted to even, you know, maybe you do class in Zoom, but to help engage your virtual community, to create your virtual classroom, you got your students to come on, make accounts, and, and join you in your live streams of, like, doing specific projects, right? This could be very important in skills-based instructions. could be, like... Uh, really cool in coding and stuff like that where students could watch you code when you could talk about it while you're doing it um art you know definitely something i could see an uh, you know an art teacher doing outside of class right maybe you do have physical class and you can get to meet you know face to face but um, i had an art instructor come to me at one point and he, he just needed help going more online because they were running out of space they couldn't have the art studio as much as they wanted it so a solution there could have been that he could have done more instruction and and shown how he does his painting and his techniques through Twitch or something like that. And the students could watch live while he does it and then come to class to do their own work later on. Like these are ways that you could use a tool like this. Um, but I, I think I I think I got the two minute elevator speech, you know, done yeah. three minutes ago at this point where yes, it's just a know. video based platform with community. It, it is built to make your students make people engage with you while you're using it. Yeah. No, I think that's kind of the the selling point about it. Now granted, I, I will I will, you know, give to this is that many would be like, Well, you know, I can do this through Zoom or another platform that's more common in education. And you're right, you can do a lot of this. Um I think the advantage with Twitch is the interface that it shows, the way that again, the big selling point with with Twitch is made for just streaming, but they do have education communities using it. Yeah. Um and they're aware of it. They know that this is a thing that's happening. Um, and one of the advantages with a Twitch is the, I definitely think kind of the subs subscription um, interface where people can jump on, get notified about stuff that you're doing um, and chat directly into the video while it's happening live. And the chat system is definitely much different in Twitch. It allows for a little bit more of an engaging, fun community type of thing. Um, and again, this isn't going to fit in every educational context, but like your point, I think my immediate reaction to a Twitch was this would be really good for um, that type of like skills based, you know, instruction type of thing where students can ask questions while you're doing what you're doing, yeah. um, while you're showing what you're doing. Because at the end of the day, that's what Twitch is most often doing. People are displaying things or doing things and it's meant to be able to have chat happening live while it's happening while somebody's doing something they can engage with the audience right. and it keeps them <laughs> in, engaged in what's going on. Using Twitch to stream almost always answers the question, how do I do something, right? But yeah. it's either implicit or explicit. I, I've watched a number of streams of people playing a video game, and all they're doing is playing the video game. They are not trying to teach me how to play, right? It is not their intent to go mm -hmm. on stream, show their moves, this is how you click this, make sure to click that, run this way. You know what I mean? That's like that they're just there playing the game. But implicitly, right, I'm watching it and I'm getting instruction like, oh wow, did you see how he moved that way, picked that up, did this thing? And I get some level of of of, of how. I learn some how that they do things. On the other side, if you're being an instructor, like you could go the explicit route, right? And not <laughs> Not like, you know, E for explicit, but like be explicit with your students that you are teaching them something. This is how to do something. Do it instructionally. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, with honestly using Twitch for both. Like imagine if you were trying to do some physics uh, instruction and you just got on there and started doing some stuff, right? Not necessarily like, you know, like a lecture, like, all right, today we're going to learn about viscosity by handling these two different liquids and we're going to learn their whatever viscous point that does something else right wow yeah uh, we're so good at science and and the voice wasn't it just we should have we should have added that to our skills yeah science <laughs> science that should have been a part of our skills or the instructor could go on and just say hey folks another class time today uh let's let's do some let's do some experiments and just pull stuff out 
and start playing with different types of liquids, different things at different viscosities and seeing what happens. And then maybe by the end of it, giving some explicit instruction, right? But but it doesn't have to be a classroom the entire time in the traditional sense. There, are, I think this is one of the things that Josh and I said earlier. There's a ways to just diversify your approach and think of delivering your content in new ways. I'd love to go on a, yeah. a Twitch stream and just literally watch a physics instructor playing pool, right? Just playing pool to show how physics works with that or throwing throwing bowling putt balls at things like whatever you, i'd watch it like that sounds fun to me we should not teach science um <laughs> no. <laughs> no i'm just checking but like this is where i think we were getting at in the virtual like how to use where i could see twitch being helpful is um you can create kind of this dynamic with a virtual classroom like if you have an online course that you're running and there's a lot of you know regular content in the online course you can have session points throughout each week where it's simply you getting onto a twitch type software or twitch itself um and like you know doing some instruction through there it's just understood that hey i'm gonna do this session this time uh the night we're gonna either we're gonna answer questions that you guys have had all week um, oh, yeah, yeah. about stuff we're gonna jump on twitch and do that or i'm gonna show you guys how to do this um you know type yep. of thing whether it's you know displaying something in the course that you want to work through or doing science um, doing science um uh, you can bring slides like they can, you can do all of that stuff but the advantage with like a twitch experience that i'd love to see more people doing in a virtual experience is we do a lot of like scheduled sessions where that are supposed to replicate class mm. but in like an online course that's kind of constantly moving it'd be nice to do like slots for sessions where you come in and students can come in if they want um, but the advantage of like a twitch is that if they they're not able to um that stuff records and it's all accessible that they can get to it. And it kind of creates a library of videos into your account that you make. So students can come check that out. Um, again, I'm kind of Twitch is one of those things where I'm like back and forth on it because I like the idea of it. Um, I think it's a good tool. Um, but it's also one of those things that like, I can see other alternatives that people are more comfortable with if they could replicate sure. similar stuff in it's not. Um, but I think the advantage of like a Twitch is just, it would be a cool experience. And I think it would be engaging for students to come in and do it because it's different and new um and i love the chat based element of it i don't think it would completely replace all virtual classroom stuff that you're doing with your students but they'd be great sessions for q a's they'd be great sessions for displaying something for your students just going through a certain element of content and allowing your students in very a kind of low low commitment element to come in and chat on there and connect with you in a different way in this kind of virtual experience um, that can help enhance the rest of the stuff that's going on in an online course or even in face-to-face -face class hmm. um through it so that's why i think it's it's i'd love to see more people playing around with it i think it has some advantages it's clearly a tool that has done well at engaging people online in a live experience that people spend hours engaging into it now granted that has to do some with the content that's in there but there is this intuitiveness about a twitch um that allows for this very different kind of um live display chat system uh that we see in streaming that i think could be very helpful within education yeah i appreciate though like your your sentiment there about you're not all in like i can get pretty excited about ed tech if anybody hasn't picked that up by now what? but um maybe my biggest concern about twitch is that you are if you use it for a classroom experience and if you have the students like comment on it and stuff you are asking them to make an account um and some some institutions actually have policies against that they're you know you can't make students make free accounts and stuff like that i respect that it is a privacy concern um it is something that i would maybe just get your students consent before you use it as as that at that level right you could always use twitch just to stream nobody has to make an account to watch your stream but if you want them to interact with you do other stuff like that do certain types of interactions they need to make an account and it's not something that you're going to be able to get the setup with your university tomorrow and have everybody get a, you know, a university EDU account or something with Twitch, right? They're probably going to have to use their personal Gmail account or whatever. And that's, I'm not as comfortable with that. I really would rather folks at least go into that knowingly, you know, to, to consent to that experience before having to do that for a classroom, classroom engagement. There's of course an accessibility concern. This is a video based platform. So that's always going to be an issue. Um, I don't know if their platform is usable by a screen reader, even to get to text and, 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 you know, subtitles, captions, if you have those. So it's not perfect. It's not even going to fit every type of classroom, but I agree with Josh. It'd be so cool to see more people at least give it a shot and, and see if, if they can, you know, pull something off with it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, go check it out. I mean, if you have not yet, feel free to go do it. Um, 
again, I think it's kind of your choice what you want to do with it. I, but I think Twitch has some possibilities. It's definitely a place you can create a virtual classroom experience for students in a different way. And I think that's why we, we recommended it, why we wanted to talk about it. So, um, yeah, go check it out. It's just uh, twitch.tv. That's literally the link uh, that you go to. Very simple. Um, and you can go ahead and try setting up an account um, and check it out, um, you know, and stream for your first time. And you can say, I've streamed. Or just go you know? watch some streams. That might give you some or ideas. Or go watch some stuff. Although yeah. you'll find some uh, interesting things on Twitch. <laughs> um, so, but on that note, uh, thank you again for joining us another week, the High Tech Podcast, where we're just trying to talk about how we harness that good old technology to enhance classroom, whether physical or virtual. Look, we talked about it. We used the word. Um, and uh, hanging out with us as we, we go down this journey along with you in the ed tech world and trying to figure out how we do all of this. So, see ya. See ya.